Hello, welcome to another one of my readings. We will once again be focusing on r slash no sleep. Without any further ado, let's get right into the story. Betsy the doll. Like most people these days, I had a fucked up childhood. Who doesn't, right? My father took off before I was born and my mother was left to take care of me on her own. The skills she was sorely lacking. My mother slipped right back into the drug adult body lifestyle that she enjoyed before I was born and had soon enough turned a two-bedroom apartment into an opium den. For the first five years of my life, I walked around in a confused, terrifying mist. The smoky air would float down the hallway from the living room and slip under my bedroom door. It always seemed to linger for days. I know now that my mother wasn't a bad person, just a victim of her addictions. When she did have spare money, she would put food on her house or buy me clothes from Goodwill. The only piece of furniture I had in my bedroom was a mattress set in a little blue and white toy chest. Not that I had a lot of toys to put in it, of course. Just the three I had gotten for my birthdays. One was an art kit, one was a red wagon, and the last, my pride and joy, was a doll named Betsy. Betsy was my best friend. We would have imaginary tea parties together, sleep together, and even take baths together. Sometimes, I even remember her voice. When I thought back on my conversations with the doll in adulthood, I realized I was lucky suffering from delusions, thanks to the always present butts of smoke that laid the clam and dingy hallways and drafty bedrooms of our small apartment. Still, I remember the sound of her voice, a pleasant, tingling lilt that was almost always coupled with a raucous giggle. I also remember the things that she said to me and the things she wanted me to do. She asked me to steal, usually food or pens and pencils. She wanted me to bring her forks and knives and hit a bad man who slept on her couch. It was always something and I would always get in trouble, but she wouldn't. When I told my mother who had put me up to these games, she would cough and shake her head. She never believed me. Adults never do. Around my sixth birthday, I asked my mother for a birthday party. I wanted to invite the mean girls from school and serve them cake and ice cream to make them like me. I remember standing in the kitchen that day with such hopes, having just asked the most important question of my entire life. The glass bottle of Coca-Cola I held was shaking my nervous hand. I waited with bated breath as my mother continued putting groceries away, almost as if she hadn't heard me, but I knew she had. Finally, just as I had failed a second time to muster the courage to repeat my question, she turned around and gave me a flippant shake of her head. A birthday party? Laura, that's ridiculous. I can't afford to feed 15 children that aren't even mine. Hell, I can't barely afford to feed you. Eat like an elephant, especially for a girl your size. Or, I'm sorry, Betsy does. There's barely anything left for me to eat around here, much less a classroom of other people's brats. My face fell as she shook her head, almost something else on her breath and stumbled off into the living room. I heard the music go up then, as more people walked in the door, some left, some stayed. I never knew them either, Ray. It was, simply wasn't fair. My mother threw parties all the time. What about me? I was a kid. All my friends had birthday parties, and all the mean girls at school would know that I was too poor to have one, and they would tease me even more. I felt the tears start to well in the corner of my eyes as I choked back a sob, while I ran up to my room and slammed the door behind me. Betsy was lying on the bed and smiling. She was always smiling. Usually it made me feel better, but today it made me angry. She just kept staring at me, smiling. She was going to tell me to do something bad again. That's why mother wouldn't show me a birthday party. It was because of all the trouble I got into because of her. This was her fault. Betsy didn't have to go to school and Betsy never got in trouble like I did. And in my own mind, I truly believed it was a doll. Not my mother who was to blame for everything. I snapped then. I screamed in indignant rage and I threw the bottle as hard as I could on the bed. It hit Betsy on her forehead and she fell on the floor. Good. I picked up the bottle and I hit her again, and again. I thought I heard her laugh, and I hit her harder. Then I laughed. When 
my wrench was spent, I dragged Betsy to my toy chest and threw her in. It slammed shut and I kicked the chest against the wall. I never wanted to see Betsy again. Ever. I never owned another doll after Betsy. After a week later, the police came and two nice ladies took me to live in a new home with the state. With food and toys and no drugs. The trunk went into storage and the wagon disappeared. I never saw my mother again. As I got older, my foster parents admitted she was in jail, doing 25 years. That was fine with me. I felt nothing for her anyways. I still had nightmares because of my life with that woman. But then, slowly, I began to heal. I focused on doing well in school and I ignored my mother's letters from prison. She reached out to me several times in my 20s as well, but I always declined her calls. That is, until this morning. I'm 30 now, with my own children and a loving, honest husband. I have a beautiful house, two dogs, and a career as a social worker trying to make a difference for kids who had it bad like me. I'm happy. I'm steady, and I'm content. So when I got a voicemail from my mother informing me that she had been paroled that she wished to speak, I decided to let her stay in peace. Since the kids were home from school, I went down to a shed in the backyard to return my mother's call. The shit was in the children's domain, and they used it to play in the summer. I sat on my old toy chest, which was currently being used as a tea party table, and dialed the number that she had left me. Three rings. Hello? Laura? Hello, mother. How are you? Oh, Laura. Thank you for speaking to me. I know you have your own life now, and a family. I would love to meet them someday. I just wanted to tell you how sorry I am. For everything. Mother, you're not meeting my kids. Ever. And since you called me, I'm going to tell you what I have needed to say for years. The opium. The heroin. They destroyed you. And the worst of it is that you always took me down with you. I was five. There was no home for a child. Honestly, I'm surprised it took you so long to get caught. Laura, I know how it seems, but... I honestly know nothing. Look, it hardly matters, and I do understand why you feel that way. Why you would hate me and not want to meet your little ones. I had learned a lot about forgiveness while I was away, and... Oh, Laura, I'm so sorry about Betsy. Betsy? I paused, confused. Why would you care about her? I know, Laura. Believe me, I do. It was all my fault. The drugs, the partying, and Betsy. Oh, God, if only I had paid attention. If I had known. She's gone now, and it's because of me. As my mother began to cry, I tapped my fingers against the toy box impatiently. The drugs had clearly fried her brain. Mother, I sighed. Why are you talking about Betsy? And why do you even care? I know where Betsy is. Right underneath me. What are you talking about, Laura? Oh God, where is she? I shifted uncomfortably. Well, Betsy's in the trunk, where she's always been. There was a bit of stunning silence. What do you mean your sister's in the trunk? Sister? What the hell are you talking about? Back on the drug so soon? That's a record, even for you. Betsy's a goddamn doll. I locked her in my toy box a few days before you got arrested for possession. Laura. Oh, God. No, no, Laura, what have you done? I wasn't arrested because of the drugs, Laura. I was arrested because of Betsy's disappearance. You always called her your little doll, but we thought you knew. Oh, God. We thought you knew, Laura. No, what have you done to my baby? My mind had gone blank, with no emotion. I set the phone down next to me and stood up. I could hear the muffled sound of my mother's anguished cries and feel the dark clutch of possibility in my own chest. Memories were stirring in the back of my mind, threatening to flood forward into my consciousness. They pushed against the door in my mind that had always been locked so tightly for so long I had forgotten it was even there. Was it even possible? Could the trauma and opium have really led me to believe that a small child was actually a doll? Begging for food and utensils to eat with? Asking me to protect her from bad men? No. I slowly turned around and brought my eyes down to the makeshift tea party table. 
Surely it was too small. You couldn't fit a person in there. You couldn't. But then, what about a very small, starving, emaciated child? But what about her? Would she fit? Would an investigator even bother looking for a person in the chest? I knew I wouldn't. It was just too small, and I was sure we had opened the toy box at some point over the years. Hadn't we? Or had something swimming in the dark recess of my memories always stopped me? I couldn't remember ever seeing it open. I knelt down to the ground and opened the clasps. It would be better not to look. After all that I had overcome, this new life I had earned for myself, it could all be undone by opening this toy box. I shouldn't open it. I should throw it to a landfill and forget it ever existed. I should not look inside. I opened the chest. I never had a doll. My mother never could afford to buy me one. I never had a wagon either, for that matter. But I did have a toy box. A pretty blue and white toy box. And when I was five, I beat my little sister to death and put her in it.